Performa Heroes, what's going on? Welcome to the Performa Popcast. This is the podcast or popcast where we talk about really everything. We talk about fitness, maybe a little bit of pop culture. We get to know some people together, or I introduce you guys to people that I know. Um, so you, when you guys hear this, it will have passed a little bit, you know. Um, but, you know, I was watching the Olympics. First of all, I'm your, I'm your host, Peter Sir. You guys know me. You don't care. Um, I was watching the Olympics the other day, and then I was watching the track and field, obviously, and then I was like, oh my God, I got to have Corey on the podcast, because Corey is literally the only person I knew, I know, that, uh, the only person I ever met that did what he did. So we're going to talk about, uh, so uh, my guest today is Corey White. Corey White was a former Division I athlete. He was a uh, member of the track and field team at the University of Southern California, AKA USC fight on. Um, he is now a, uh, a recruiter in the tech space. And we're going to talk about all sorts of things, fitness and whatnot. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for my guest today on the podcast, Corey White. Be, 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 be. Okay. So if you guys are watching this, some of you guys are listening. Some of you guys are watching. We're going to start off this because I'm fascinated by why Corey, why do you have, like, what's the deal with Corey has swords on his wall. Two swords, plural. Wait, do you have more than two? Yeah, two swords. Okay. Not two. So talk to me about the swords, because that's not a thing that you see every day on someone's wall. Well, first and foremost, thanks for having me, Peter. Yay. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Woohoo. Uh, so I'm out here in my office. Uh, we had an office built during quarantine. It's like a tough shed, and then it's fixed up inside. Uh, we got like, you know, insulation and drywall and flooring and it's a legit room i got great lighting and i could decorate it any way i wanted so <laughs> i've owned these two swords since high school i don't really have a good reason i picked them up when i was a kid it made sense and i've just had them in boxes so we got this kind of brick uh facade background and yeah. i'm like i'm mounting my swords but so, like okay. this is my space is that real brick or is it like does it look like brick it's no not brick. it's like it's like a, a knife of an inch thick made of little okay. fluffy kind of textured plasticky stuff so fun so fun fact obviously i do stand up and in a lot of stand-up comedy clubs the backdrop is a brick wall and in some of them it's an actual brick wall and in other ones it's a, like what you have like it looks like a wall but you touch it you're like oh this will like literally fall down if i hit it too hard so yeah if you recall uh, i had a podcast for for a while i've since stopped doing it insert context you know, if I get a bunch of new listeners, then, you know, maybe I'll pick it up again. Yeah, definitely have some shit to talk. But insert context, feel free to check that out. Yeah. I used to, I, I kind of built this office with the purpose of doing the podcast here. Got my microphone, got pretty decent insulation for sound yeah. purposes. Um, and I just kind of hung it up, you know, busy with work and stuff and wasn't promoting Pod it enough. Podcasting is fun, yeah. but it's also like, I mean, like a good podcast, I feel like you have to put a lot of work into it on for a number, like promoting it. Like if you don't know your guests, like kind of doing the research about it. So like you kind of know what questions to ask and whatnot. Like, I don't know. I mean, but ultimately it's just like, it's that thing where it's like, are people listening or not? And it's like, for me, yeah. for, for me, I, I'll, I'll keep talking no matter what, like, yeah. I don't, like, do you know what I mean? Because this is the thing. And this is, this is kind of, uh, it's a, this is my stand up comedy side speaking, but like it's morbid of me to think this way. But I always feel like if I were to tragically die, right? Sure. He heaven forbid. Um, and then people are like, oh, what did he do? Like, oh, he was a comedian or, and he did podcasts. And if I didn't have any of that like out there, then no one yeah. would ever hear it. So, like, that's why, you know, I, I had two albums that I recorded comedy wise. And about to do another one by the time they hear this um because it's like what if i die and like I, I need something to show for like all this years all these years of work that i put in so it's like i feel sure. like people ask me about podcasting i'm like just do it man just get it out there let the world hear it eventually you know because what's weird like because you did it how long did you do yours for it uh about a year the okay. 17 episodes okay so did you ever pay attention to like sorry guys this is if this is boring to you guys, but this is exciting. We're talking on a podcast about podcasts. Um, yeah. Did you ever get like the, uh, 
like the metrics like did you ever look at the metrics where they like yeah okay i don't do that that's good <laughs> that's good i don't do it however sometimes like it, they'll send me like they'll send me like an email or whatever and it'll be like oh your podcast is number 97 in austria or that I mean, you're like mm -hmm. wait what who the mm -hmm. like who's listening or like in egypt like i was in the top one like and it's like so that is like well how are these people in egypt or austria or germany like how are people discover like because i i wouldn't think about that but it's like okay well cool like you just never know who's listening you know Sure. People You've have been in the work for a while. People people have lots of time on their hands too. I think, uh, especially nowadays with so many jobs, like you can kind of do them at a computer, or at a desk, right. and like passive listening, or you're driving. A lot of people yep. commute. Like I don't know. Uh, I say you keep doing it, Corey. We'll see. I might get yeah. back to it. Uh, but it's cool that you have swords in the background. Sure. I wish I yeah. wish there was a better story then yeah then nothing got. that cool I, I i didn't vanquish any dragons or you know slay any any beasts i, I didn't know if maybe swords. i didn't know if maybe you were because i had uh actually one of my friends uh jen on the on this podcast uh a couple months ago and she's a she's a bodybuilder and mm -hmm. one one of the competitions that she won she got a fucking sword <laughs> Right, that's pretty dope. And I'm like, not that cool of a story. Yeah, I'm like, that's dope, dude. To have like a sword, just like, or like, I'm sure The Rock probably got one from like doing Hercules that he probably has hanging. Yeah, somewhere. for sure, like, right? You know what I mean? So I did do, I, I did one fitness competition, like ten years ago now. I I remember because that's when we worked together. I think yeah, like everybody was doing. I did it with yeah. Derek. Everyone yeah, was doing right. Them, right. So I did yeah, one in Vegas. It was more like a a male beauty pageant, honestly, right. but. It was, it was an interesting experience. Didn't win any swords. It's a different, uh, it's a different world, right? Yeah. Like that from going like, I mean, the thing is, it's like you're a college athlete. So it's like, I think anybody who's a college athlete always has that like desire to like compete in some way or another, whether sure. it's, whether it's, you know, by do literally competing on stage or like in the workspace, you know, like. For me, it's like I've, I've always felt like the fact that I was an athlete helped me in stand up because I know adversity, you know, mm -hmm. any athlete you failed before a million times. Are you kidding? I played baseball. That's like the most right. the sport where you're going to fail the most. Uh, sure. So let, let's talk about this, because like I said, I was watching the Olympics and uh, I was watching. I forgot. And I'm sorry, I forgot this guy's name, but he was like, I want to say he was like from India. Yeah, he, Chopra. He won. He won the javelin. Like the he, he sure set, did. He set the record, right? Um, I don't know or, if he set the. Record. Or he didn't set it, but he won the gold medal, it. right? Yeah, he won the gold and for sure. He knew that he won it after he released it. Like he was like he already knew. And I'm Wasn't like, that that's, awesome. Yeah, that's fucking dope, dude. Because I mean, how do you know that? Like he just knew. Like it's credible. No, you want to know that feeling? Yeah, so that feeling. It feels like nothingness. It's like if you slap a home run, you uh -huh. know, that, that sweet spot that it hits yeah. where it's not a clink. It's just like, oh yeah, and it feels like effortless. It's that. Okay. So, we can get into what javelin yeah. is. Yeah, 100%. That. That's what I want to, because I, I feel like, you know, unfortunately, or I mean, you know, we watch the Olympics. There's so many of these sports that we only watch every four years, right? Right. Like no one watches. I mean, I... I can speak for myself. I don't watch gymnastics or, I mean, honestly, track and field Harley, except every four years, you know? Yeah, it's barely televised. So, so when you see it, you're just like, man, though, like, that's fucking, that's not easy to do. None of, so none, let me I mean, tell you this. Yeah. Let me tell you this, right? So the last two Olympics, I went to the Olympic trials in 08. I went to the Olympic trials in 12. I didn't make it. I got fifth in 08. So the top three go, I think, with an alternate. Uh, I didn't make it. But uh, I watched, I was attempting to watch that one. I've been trying to watch it ever since. The Javelin is not televised. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just that we don't have, you know, strong competitors in that historically or what. But right. I can tell you that there's not nearly the, the exposure that I would love people to have. Like, there's, the Javelin is such a dynamic event. You run in a straight line. And you transfer that energy after planting your foot 
as firmly as possible into a, an eight foot long spear to throw through the air. Like okay, it is not easy to do. I'm, I'm gonna interrupt you really quick only cause I don't know the answer to this. So like how yes. far do you run before you release the javelin? So about, I mean, everyone has kind of a different approach distance, right? Okay. Um, I had an unusually long one. Okay. Um, I would say that average is like, you run like 30 meters, so like 50, no, I don't know, like 40, 50 feet. Okay. So the, the length of the javelin runway is regulated, but it's like 40, 50 feet. And then some people are on to the lanes of the track as well, like I was. Okay. So there's no like, you you can start from as far as you want, basically. Is that right. correct? Okay. Pretty much. It. I mean, as far as what's given. Got it. I would, or I might argue if I'm looking, if I'm, looking to talk excuses as to why I didn't make it. But no, 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 nope, different meet. But there's been a meet where there was a, where my generally, my usual approach was cut short by a wall. Like it wasn't uh, as long as I was used to. It was a shorter run rate than usual, threw me off a little bit, whatever. Uh, that was NCAA section. But um, yeah, so th I guess it's regulated. It has to be a certain length, but then people go beyond it into the, Lanes as needed. Got it. Okay. And then, okay, so, and then you, you step, like, I mean, because you, you can't, obviously there's like a line that you can't pass, right? Right. And is there like, there's like an elevated thing or is it just a line like flush? No, it's just the line that's flush. So okay. there's a, there's a uh, judge and official watching it and then right. you'll see a white flag or a red flag, you know, if they're, if there's, if they, step on the line on accident, red flag. Uh, if the thrower doesn't like the throw, they'll generally step over the line and they'll throw up the red flag. And that happened quite a bit, actually. This, this Wait, so like, like if you throw it and you realize you don't like it, you could step on it and get like a, do, like a mulligan, basically? It just, it just gives an X. It just uh -huh. put an X up. They just, it doesn't show on your scores, like on your, on your results afterwards. So how many times do you get to throw it? So generally you come in and for qualifying, you got three throws. There was like, what, 30 people or so. There was a group A and a group B. You have three, generally you have three throws and the top get a final three throws, got get it. another three. Uh -huh. So the top, however many, uh, get another three. So the top 12 got another three throws. And then those people, the next day, those that was the first day of competition. The next day of competition, they had three, and they pretty much, and then the top eight from there got another three. So total of twelve throws in the Olympics. If you okay, go to the finals. Got it. And you remind me again, because I know we talked about it before, but how how heavy is the javelin? Yeah, so it's I, I've heard about the weight of eight baseballs, eight hundred grams. Okay. And um, it's, so it's not very heavy. It's like okay, that's not two, very heavy just over all. two pounds, like okay. two pounds. But uh, the challenge isn't so much the weight as it is the shape. Right. Right. So you, as you throw it, you want to envision a quarter, you know, something the size of that javelin. And you want to envision throwing the entire thing through that ring. So you don't throw it like, a, like you would a baseball where it's all in your hand. You have to more guide it into the right direction. Yeah, that I mean, it's obviously it's it's skill, but I mean, it also takes tremendous athleticism. Like, yeah, I mean, so it's not like it's not I mean, not to. People like on the Olympic curling team are probably not going to throw the javelin is all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> so it's when people ask me all the time, you know, how do you train for that? Yeah, that, throwing that, that, all the time. That's the next question, right? Scratch off that one. Well, no, that, that was not my question because I would know I would I would because from being a baseball player, like you don't I don't just work my shoulders, like I'm working my legs, I'm working my head, I'm working everything. Mainly legs, obviously. Right. That's so if you want to connect it from. to that's where the power comes from, right? Power, legs to the hips. Um, so if you want to talk about the uh, comparison to baseball, think about throwing in from center field to home. That's what I do so all the time, Corey. There you go. Fucking host people. Home. Sorry, guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, performation. I said a bad word. It's okay. <laughs> so, yeah, it's more like that than pitching, if you're comparing, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's more of that angle. And so to train, 
it really is a full body, a full body event. You train legs. We did a whole, I became what I considered, what I would consider to be near expert level in Olympic lifting. So in the clean is something that I consider myself able to teach other people. And that's something just the, the hip hinge, the yeah. hip complex and being able to apply that and the core as an extension to your hips. That's, that's the training. That's, that's what you're looking to, to build is that awareness and that connectivity and that strength, um, explosive dynamic strength. Right. And then, yeah, a whole, there is a lot of shoulder, uh, more preventative really right. like yeah, specific yeah. shoulder stuff. And there's this kind of something that's identifiably, identifiably javelin is sort of like a tricep curl and then a reach back with the lats. So lats to tricep curl pullovers. Oh, interesting. Like yeah. ly lying down, you mean? Lying down, yeah. Okay. So that's okay. something that's identifiably javelin. But uh, yeah, it definitely a full body exercise and a lot of technique when you consider you're running at, you know, 70% of top speed in a straight line. And then, like I said, you come to a complete stop and turn that into yeah, a throw. Yeah, it's crazy. And then you just chuck it like for like yards. Like what, 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 what did he get? How far did he throw it? Uh, I want to say he was 80, was it 86 meters? 86, 86 meters, I think. And so because I'm American, I right. don't know how far that is. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, let me see. I can do that. Uh, so my furthest, to kind of put it in perspective, the furthest I ever threw was just under 83 meters. Okay. So 82.97 was my furthest throw. Dang, so you could have was... been in the Olympics, Corey. You're so close. Yeah, I mean, if I threw my furthest throw that day. Yeah. Uh, but let's see, 83, <laughs> that's 272. Okay. So 86, another three meters, nine feet, 272, so, 280 and so that, change. So he's basically, plus. he's like in basically like pretty deep in the outfield if you're comparing it to like baseball or like across a football field, basically. Consider punting from one end zone yeah. to about the 20. Yeah, like I'm just saying, like that's like that's fucking far, dude. That's crazy. It's far. Man, I feel so useless now. <laughs> Don't we all? like we've oh, had yeah? like <laughs> oh you feel useless? <laughs> Try being good at throwing a spear and then applying that to the business world. Hey, no you want to talk about the useless skills. No, listen though, but but like we were talking about though, the fact that you competed, especially I mean, competed at any level, but like division one, top notch. You know, back then it was the Pac-10, yes? It wasn't the Pac-12 yet, correct? Or was that right around the same time that they expanded? Oh, uh, good question. I want to say the 12, I graduated in 09. So okay. I want to say the 12 was just after that. Yeah, I think so. I think that came like like 12 or 13, maybe. I don't remember exactly. But, um, but like, you know, you apply that competitiveness, like to excel in whatever career you choose. I mean, most athletes that I know, actually that's not true because you meet some people that are like, just, I'm sorry guys, but like maybe like slothy. You're like, yeah, I was a football player in college. You're like, really? Like, so you know, me, like <laughs> I, you're right. You're right. And it's hard to, I'm not one to be slothy. So that, yeah, no, definitely no, not. No, I'm very, I'm definitely an active and competitive person. Uh, definitely in the gym on a regular basis. This shifted from becoming a personal trainer into the recruiting space, but I still do have a couple of clients. Definitely going to tell you about one of them soon. We'll get to oh, that. Remind oh, me. let's go. Yeah, but, I'll uh, remind you. Not yet. One client. Little nugget. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it, the, one of the most difficult things for me was I became exceptionally good at an arbitrary, obscure talent, right? A, yeah. a, a, a skill that is not remember me mentioning it's not televised that means right. it doesn't get a ton of sponsorships so right. there's not a huge uh void to fill when it's on, when it comes to careers in javelin throwing you <laughs> right. can be the best or you can just kind of get by travel a bunch i did travel a bunch at the expense of the track meets that i visited europe uh south korea a lot of uh went to brazil a lot of mexico canada all over the place. 
but you're not making a ton of money. And you're talking to a, you're talking to a comedian, a comedian, right? <laughs> but the difficult thing, let me tell you, I was really good at that. And I applied everything that I had to being good at that. What do I want to apply everything to next? Yeah. You know, what's worth it? What is motivating enough to apply? Like, I know what it takes to be the best. I wasn't that. And I applied everything. So what do I do next that is deserving of that type of attention? That took a long time for me to yeah. sort that. That's, that's not soul, easy. That's some soul searching right there. Yeah. I, yeah. I imagine that's a thing that a lot of athletes um, experience is you, you, you pour everything into your sport. You don't spend time on internships. You don't have those part-time jobs, you know, while you're going to school, kind of figuring out what you want. You're going to school so that you can be really good at your sport. Uh, some people are also like become doctors and shit in the meantime and good on them. But I'm telling you, most, most athletes, it's a whole yeah. lot of attention paid to what it is that you're there for. And that doesn't lead to a, an easy transition into the business world. Right. Now, but uh, you went to USC. So what was your major in US, at USC? So I started at University of Redlands. Oh, that's I right. At, Duh, yeah, I always that's forget right. that, dude. So Shout out to football. the 909. <laughs> out in Redlands. <laughs> I was playing football and doing track. Okay. And I threw discus in high school. So I threw discus when I went to college. I did okay. Uh, the college discus is bigger. My hands are smaller than a lot of discus throwers. Relatively small. I can't grip a ball. I can't palm a basketball. I don't know. Really? No, never dunked one either. So there's that. No but, way, uh, Corey. Really? Uh, yeah, never dunked yeah. a ball. You're a lot taller than me. I'm six one. Yeah, I mean, well, oh. yeah, a few inches. But uh, yeah, so um, I, I was playing football and doing track. I started getting really good. I tried out. I just started throwing the javelin in college. I picked it up freshman year. I did really well that first year. Went to the junior. I, I was one of two Americans representing the, the country in the junior Pan-American games, which was under 19 thing. But that was like my intro yeah. into international competition. right? But uh, then I blew my ACL playing football. Wow. And I remember that was my junior year. I remember talking to my mom before that year thinking, you know, I have a chance to go to the Olympics. So if I do anything that jeopardizes that potential with football, I have to stop. Yep. So I blew my ACL and I'm out trying to figure out what's next. I talked to UCLA, USC, and Cal. It just wasn't a great fit with the others. Um, I got tickets to come see a football game twice for USC. At SC? At SC. Oh, Dude, sold. Being in the Coliseum, sold, of course. It lit me up. Especially, back, me up as a especially back, oh. back then when they were like, like consistently good back then. Like, I mean, they're, still me they're still pretty good. But yeah, that, those, are the, those are the good years, man. That was like November 07, had okay. my surgery in November. And during the winter break of school, between schools, like, or, you know, the winter break between terms, I was at home and I'm like, I'm going back to Redlands to pick up my shit to go somewhere. And I'm finalizing all that during those weeks. So I ended, ended up being USC, uh, moved all my stuff out there. And it was a great opportunity to continue growing. Like I got a great base and realized I was good at something but had an opportunity to continue growing under great coaching at USC. And that was the whole, like, the, the, that was the next step. Sweet. And then that's where you kind of even perfected, like, the javelin. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I left this, this, no more football, and I just started focusing on the javelin. Yeah. Basically. Uh-oh, hang on. Uh-oh. Um, okay. All right. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so, you know, I realized that um, I had to choose javelin because I had to potentially go to the Olympics. So during the winter break, I decided on USC. I packed up all my stuff and moved out there and started working with those coaches. And it was just, uh, that was definitely where the game changed for me. Like the step up in competition, the step up in the people I was training with. Dalila Muhammad just won the multiple medals. She was a teammate of mine. That was pretty cool to see. Okay. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so did you ever go to like the Olympic Training Center? It's, it wasn't Colorado Springs or something, right? Uh, there's one in Colorado Springs and there's one in Chula Vista. So right down oh. in San Diego. Perfect. 
Yeah, yeah I, I went down there for a number of uh, training, kind of like seminars. You know, uh -huh. they'd bring in the top javelin throwers from around the country, uh, do some video recording, some really slow-mo kind of biometric um, uh, observation. Like, like, like that show sports science that we that they used yeah. to have on ESPN, Just like, like that. that kind of shit? Just yeah. like that. So they had, you know, kind of like the stick figure with the pivot points mm -hmm. for you as a javelin thrower, and they kind of help you out with, they, they brought the people that had the most, the best chance of, you know, getting a medal of representing the country in and kind of helped us to perfect with some scientific. That's crazy. Evidence. That's cool. It was pretty cool. Yeah. That's like, I mean, as a baseball guy, like that's like, that's big now. Like it's almost to the point where like, and baseball, like if you're not looking at that stuff, you're probably not going to excel anymore. It's not like the old days where you can rely on like just your physical attributes. Like it's a science now, man. And like, and the guys that really get into it, release point, you know, spin rate, like it's, it's like crazy stats that like people that watch baseball, for example, like, you know, 30 years ago are like, what? And it's like, that's where it's going, man. Like they break down everything now. Like it's crazy. That's cool though, that you guys are doing it like back then, kind of like ahead of the curve. Yeah, like the, the coolest thing that I saw about the televised javelin this year is they finally implemented some of that slow-mo camera. Like uh -huh. there's some really cool angles to watch this thing that is launched. There's some really cool angles to see that I think they're missing out on. And now that there's some really dope slow-mo cameras, they're yeah. able to capture that and show how like dynamic this event is, you know? What's the name of that? There's a camera that like... Uh... Oh man, I forget what it's called, but like they used it, they started using it in movies like in the Hurt Locker, where you just like, it breaks it down to where it's like, like something like crazy, like 10,000 frames per second or something. And you can just see like mm. every little tiny thing. It's pretty cool. Now they kind of use it a lot more, but I forget, I'm just, I think it's called the Phantom actually, not that I think about it, but who knows? I, I would, if I had an assistant right here, I would Google, I would be like, hey, can you look this up for me? But I don't. So yeah, we'll just, like we'll just say it's Jamie. Yeah, exactly. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So you, 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 you complete your collegiate career, right? Uh, graduate from USC, which is obviously prestigious. And then you get in, did you, did you is that when you started training? Like right after that? Yeah. So I, I have the, that's not necessary. Uh, yeah, so I continued competing after USC. After I graduated in 09, uh -huh. continued competing then for the 2012 Olympics. And then one more year after that for, towards the world championships, didn't make them. But uh, yeah, I started my personal training career, I guess, 2009. Started working at 24 Hour Fitness, who had a deal with the USA Track and Field. Uh, to provide athletes with jobs, you know, on, on more of a flexible schedule. Really? So that they continue training. Yep. And okay, um, cool. so I did that. And I was there for a little over a year. And then I, and that's where I met you. This is 24. where we met. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And then I, and then I got fired. <laughs> yeah, I did too, bro. Like I did too. Everyone does, right? Or you go Everyone and start gets your own fired. Thing. News, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> I, <laughs> we all got fired from 24 hour fitness and now we're doing, you know, better things. Better. So, yeah. You know, Everyone, you know. all the good ones leave and do their own thing. For sure. Um, it's a good stepping so, yeah. point though. It's, it's a good, For like, sure. it's, a, it's a good stepping stone. And I met a lot of cool people that I still talk to and, you know, met some great people yeah. had the opportunity to like, you know, build uh, work on building schedules and how to work on client. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Hanging out with famous people at that gym. Cause there was so that many happened. famous people that fucking worked there. It was, crazy the dude from sons of anarchy i was just dude, i was just gonna say that was where sons of anarchy got ruined for me for like a second because i didn't know that charlie hunnam was english until yeah. i met until i met him at he was jacks to me and then yeah, one Jason day, was training him yeah one day he came in and was asking me about i was we were doing like a, so we didn't have sleds there this is before they had the turf and everything have right. you actually been there since they put in the turf and not stuff? Not that one, no. I don't live, I don't live in Hollywood. I don't okay, go so they, I was working out there a few years ago, and they have like a whole, like upstairs is like turf with sleds and tires and shit now. That's cool. Cool, right? Yeah, it would have been great. 
but so we didn't have it back then when I worked there. And so we would get like the towel and put the, the weight on top of the towel and push it across the workout floor, like the, the, you know, aerobics room. Right. Yeah. And like, just, you know, being, being resourceful. And then I remember him coming into the room and I'm like, Oh shit. Like fucking Jackson's about to come talk to me right now. He's like, excuse me, mate, but what's that exercise for? And I was like, what the fuck did you just say, dude? Like, why are you talking like that? <laughs> I heard Where's your Harley? Yeah, like, well, he, remember he used to ride a motorcycle, though. He would ride a motorcycle. Yeah, he rode a motorcycle and he would park it in front of the gym. And I'm like, oh, he really, that's why I like, I was like, that's Jack. Because he rode up in a motorcycle and he would park it in front of the gym. And then he talked to me with a little English accent. I was like, oh, man. But that's a dope fucking show, though. Yeah. Like, that was one of the best. Honestly, like, for me, that's like top five shows of all time, honestly. Have you seen The Wire? I have, and that's up there too. I was just Breaking I, Bad. I mean, I lived bit Breaking Bad. Okay. Breaking, I, that, do you not do you not know about my dad, Corey? I I do, but was he uh, cooking in a trailer? He was. Uh, well, we don't have to get into it. Yeah, I'm sure yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've Sorry, already. <laughs> now, actually, I, I don't talk about it on this podcast because this is more about our guests. But yes. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, you know, like, so anyway, we all worked at the gym. We met a lot of cool people. It was cool. It was a good experience until we got yeah. fired. <laughs> so I, I left, you know, I got out of training in 2013, more or less. And I started working in recruiting up in LA. That's where I started working at this small boutique recruiting firm, kind of fresh, looking for my first, you know, kind of career office job sort of thing. Yeah, Felt yeah. like the right move. Um, and then got engaged and moved down to San Diego to get married and all that stuff and started working with my fiance and my wife's dad at Morgan Stanley. So when you asked if I was a financial advisor, yes, That's I used right. to be. That's got right. a series seven, 66, all that bullshit. And like did it for a while. And I was just like, this isn't for me. This isn't it. So I went back to recruiting here and eventually got fired at some place and started my own business and killed it the next year. But in addition to that, I kind of wanted to get back in touch with my personal training side, right? So I put out a couple ads, you know, kind of looking for a couple clients, not really looking to pull on a full load, just a couple clients. Uh, early on, started working with this one guy, older gentleman, I work with him three times a week still, every, you know, tomorrow morning, actually. Uh, but then I put out an ad for high school athletes, elite high school athletes looking to take the next step, like the ones that have not learned how to lift yet, the ones that haven't learned about uh, technical speed training, right? Got it, yeah. So I met this one kid who answered, his dad answers for him, and I have to go through kind of the protocol, like, hey, do you want this as much as your dad says you want this? And like, right. you know, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. really get into that. But he was a freshman. He had never learned how to lift. He had never been, he never gotten technical speed training. I taught him what I learned from USC in terms of sprint training, which is quite a bit that I picked up. You know, speed sprinting isn't part of what we do, but you observe a lot and you learn right. a lot. Yeah, yeah. In addition to that, I taught him Olympic lifting, cleans, snatches, squats, deadlifts, that kind of stuff to begin learning, you know, the pieces, the tools that he's using. Blah, blah, blah. We would work. Oh, oh we also did a lot of uh, uphill hills, like hill sprints. If you, if you want to talk about a way to burn fat, gain muscle, gain testosterone, hill sprints are your friend yeah like that's the shit right there running so anyways, up running up or down up well we we did both okay we yeah did slightly decline to train your muscles to run faster yeah to just train your body to be faster because you don't know how to be that fast when you're doing right. it on your own volition but when you go downhill your body moves faster so yeah, that's an option yeah, yeah yeah but first uphill for the building and that's for anyone uh fast forward uh, he got a scholarship to USD, which was yeah. yay us, right? Tri was a victory. Tri that's Tritons. Yeah, there you go. University of San Diego Tritons. And then COVID hits. Uh, the seniors are given a fifth year. His money's taken away. Uh, Back to the drawing board. He's still a junior at this point. So if we got stuff to figure out, we got time. Uh, we keep working together. He goes to a few like uh, perfect game uh, showcases. The baseball where, player. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, okay. sorry. He's a baseball player. Okay, got it. Okay. So what I'm working on him with mostly is, is he as a baseball player, he's doing his 60 yard dash. Right. You know, football you do a 40. Yeah. Uh, baseball you do a 60, starting in kind of like a stealing a base cut sort of position. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm working on with him. When I met him, he had he was at seven one. We helped get him down to six eight, and he's getting noticed. And he got a scholarship offer to SDSU. Yes. It's Aztecs. nearby. Aztecs. There you go. It's nearby. That's, you know, a good, got, got a good baseball program. We keep working together. Go to another show, showcase. There's a few MLB scouts there. And he's been getting some attention for a while for one of very few. He's one of many that are getting attention in Southern California. Fast forward, blah, blah, blah. It's drafted in sixth round. Fourth pick in the sixth round for the Boston Red Sox. No way. Just happened just Wait, a couple it, weeks what, ago. What's his name? Give, give him a shout Daniel, out. Daniel McElveny. Daniel I McElveny. Be more proud of this kid. Dude, that's awesome. You know I love baseball. I know. That's why yeah, I thought like that, that's my nugget. That's my nugget. What's for you. Uh, do you, did he sign with an agent? I don't know. Probably. Okay. But I, I'm not sure how that works. But yeah, he got drafted in the sixth round, fourth pick. And he, like, in a week later, heads off, headed off to Florida. Fort Myers and getting trained up by better coaches than me. But I, mean, yeah, I couldn't be right. more happy to see him off. So is, is, he in, is he in rookie ball right now or a ball? Um, I don't know. Okay. I just know he went off to Florida. I assume there's some shakeout that takes place over there where they decide yeah. which direction people go. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's most of them start at rookie ball. And if he got drafted, that's probably where he went first, unless he was like, I mean, some of like the higher draft picks will go like straight to like double A or it just, it just depends, but yeah. Yeah. I don't really know much about that. I'm not a baseball player. I was just able to teach him about overall speed and lifting, you know, what what position does he play? Shortstop. And he's a, he's drafted as a utility player. Yeah. That's crazy. Good for you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. I got, I got, I got lots of, uh, I still have lots of friends in baseball, man. I fucking like, I haven't really gotten into baseball on this show, but I talk about baseball a lot. Like that's all I do. I'm literally there's the baseball, the Dodgers are on, on the TV right now. Um, <laughs> so, so now you're, you know, so now you're a recruiter, which is yes, way different than, way different than, than throwing the javelin than training yeah. and training a person than anything. But like I said, I feel like your competitive nature, like, like, what do you do? Do you, do you like scour the internet looking for people that are qualified or like, like, That's I don't even, more I, less I have it, man. no idea how that works. That, that more or less sums it up. So my job involves on one hand, finding companies that are open to working with an expert to help them hire because uh-huh. you know, the people that are the software development manager is building shit and leading a team. And he's also thinking I have to hire, but he's not spending the time searching, scouring the internet, if you will. So they work with someone like me. I generally work with startups like 50 to 100 employee type size uh-huh. that have funding. Um, and they're, help, they're coming to me to help them find the people to meet their requirements, both technically and culturally. Okay. When you say culturally, like, like diversity like the type hiring, of person they want to work like, like the type of person it. they want to work with, right? Got like, it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like I, I get to know the people that work at the company. Uh, to to the degree that I can help find the person that looks like that feels like they're going to be a good fit. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. Ah, that's crazy. Uh, and so and and the name of your company you said it's White Rabbit, right? White Rabbit Search. Hence now, yeah, the you have the a white ra- there. yeah you have a white rabbit in the background. So is there like a hidden meaning behind the white rabbit? Is it related so to Alice in Wonderland? It's definitely Alice in Wonderland theme. <laughs> So I have, uh, uh, for one, Corey White, right? White Rabbit. Ah, uh, association. Other than that, um, I have been, since I was a little kid, enthralled with Alice in Wonderland. I feel like it's just represented this, <laughs> it'd be stupid to say land of wonder, right? But like, uh, there's different, I actually have a tattoo that's under my shirt that I'm not gonna pull off right now. Yeah. But uh, I have the uh, Cheshire Cat, Cheshire Cat, the White yeah. Rabbit, the uh, Mad Hatter's Hat, and the Caterpillar. 
really sort of represent like wisdom, chaos, mischief, and adventure. Kind of, you know, they have some meaning to them. The tattoos have uh, my daughter's uh, birth date in there and a few different things. But uh, yeah, so the white rabbit, it's the way I see it is uh, you can spend all day, you know, down, down the rabbit hole, basically, searching yeah. for the perfect person for your company. I live here. I know the area. I can help guide you and find you the right people. Yeah, let me it's ask you a question. Uh, Shoot. This is all fascinating. And this is a follow up question. So to my knowledge, um, the book Alice in Wonderland is a little bit different than like the Disney cartoon that we all grew up watching and so forth. For sure. Um, and kind of insinuating that like Alice is doing some crazy drugs. Am I, am I correct in that statement? No, uh, that's definitely a, a narrative that was picked, that's been picked up by stoners. generations of stoners and, <laughs> you know, acid. And um, actually, can you see that picture up there? Probably not. It's so far. I away. mean, I could see colors. It looks like mushrooms and yeah, it's a caterpillar. It's like a, yeah, it's like an acid. Yeah, uh, Alice in Wonderland trip thing that my wife got me. It's random. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely been a lot tied to it, uh, and it's totally possible that Lewis Carroll experimented with hallucinogens at the time, but there's not a lot of evidence to support it. Nor is there a lot of evidence to support that he was oddly interested in a young girl named Alice. Just that he was more like a f old man friend. Got That's it. kind of what I gathered and a creative mind. But is Alice herself taking drugs? No, it was a, it was a yeah. nap. It was a, a, a nap, kind of a dream uh, kind of thing that took place. Okay, so the rumors are not true. It's the exact opposite of her life. They, they, tend, they try to show her very buttoned up, very proper, uh, constrained, oppressed even life, uh -huh. you know, as a in the English, uh, whatever age that is. Right. But then the opposite of that being disorder, wacky, crazy, okay. wonder, every, everything in the imagination that's the opposite of correct. Okay. So this is a not related, but related question to this. Shoot. Have, have you, <laughs> and this is, by the way, you guys, this has not been discussed on this podcast, podcast, um, but it just, I thought of it as we were talking about Alice in Wonderland, and I highly encourage every single person listening to do this. Okay, Corey, have you ever watched Wizard of Oz while listening to Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon? Yeah. You have, right? Yeah. And that, it goes together, right? Yeah. Like, if you start at the beginning and you watch Wizard of Oz, and like, Dark Side of the Moon is not a long CD. Like it's maybe like, it's maybe like 40 minutes. It's not that long. But like, if you start it and start Wizard of Oz, like it looks like it was made to go together. It's fascinating. They call that Dark Side of the Rainbow. Oh, the really? Experience. The experience, Dark Side of the Rainbow. Okay. So yeah, now let I've done that before. I think if you look at evidence again, like if you yeah. research it, it would say that there was no association intended. Of course, but, that's what they're gonna say. Yeah, right. But, uh, who knows? So I, I'm what, not this, the guy. So this is what I, because I, I tell this to people. Like somehow, I mean, this this will come up in random conversations. I'm like, no, you need to just try this, dude, because it's so fascinating. But um, it, it's it's one of two things, and I think it's the latter. But it's either Pink Floyd were sitting there, probably partaking in some hallucinogens or some narcotics of some sort. Yep. And they were like, you know, we'll go like, let's just play this music to Wizard of Oz, right? That's one way. Like they, they were they like, start yeah, we're, drumming on the table, like yeah. And they're like, they put Wizard of Oz, like yes, do and, and okay, put the drums in there and put the little. That's one way. Or like I said, I think it's the latter. I think that fast forward a few years, you know, in the seventies or whatever, people were literally getting stoned, and they happened to be watching the Wizard of Oz, and they're like, oh my god, it goes. Yep. Yeah. That's what I think happened, but I mean. Can you? Oh yeah. I gotta pee. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now I'm gonna ask you some hard questions, Corey. 
These Ooh, all like hard questions. These have all been softball questions. They're, I mean, they're not hard. They're just more thought provoking. <laughs> they're just more thought provoking. I'll say this. Try to keep it. Try to keep it light as we warm them up, and then we bring the hard hitting. Okay. Um, ah! who, who are who are three people in your life that have been the most influential? And you don't have to know them either. Influential. Jeez. Okay. Well, the first that comes to mind is my coach at USC, Dan Lang. If Dan what? Being, Dan Lang, L-A-N-G-E. Got it. If we're being honest, we didn't leave off on the best of terms. Probably a lot of my fault. It is what it is. But he's been highly influential for sure. Okay. Um, the next obvious one that comes to mind is my mom. I feel like that maybe that should have been first, but it is what it is. Uh, she's been a survivor. If we are, if you want to learn a little bit about my early self, um, I lost my father when I was two and a half and uh, my mom remarried when I was around like four, four and a half. And I lost my stepdad uh, in 2012. Oh, man. So I've experienced loss in my life. And while my dad was a huge part, my stepdad was a huge part of my life. Um, I wouldn't say that he was the most influential in this way, right? So a third, man, I don't even, Nelly? Like the rapper? Yeah. Like no, with the band? Fuck it, I don't know. That was literally the next <laughs> I thing. I was like, on. what, dude? <laughs> with the band tape? <laughs> <laughs> i mean maybe dude i don't know maybe you like i mean like i love justin timberlake like he's on my wall like right? i mean you know it's right? possible if you really is like it usher is the answer usher? i mean no i don't know um i tell you I what say... i i saw sorry i saw usher, no, usher nelly in concert a couple years ago and I, I i didn't go to see nelly i went to see new kids on the block and nelly opened for them for him gotcha. and and he was jacked still doing fine yeah I'm like, good i saw him know. actually i saw him actually at a country concert i want to say he does, he's like he does country now like yeah he does like yeah he did a crossover yep. yeah i saw him do that at a country concert I'm like there's nelly that was my wife's kind of like high school crush you know yeah uh yeah i get that <laughs> uh third i don't know man it's a hard one i know i don't know i found it early on emmett smith real talk Emmett Smith oh, yeah. as an athlete. Um, can you imagine? Big... Can you imagine being like that close? Or no, he 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 has he you know he is number one. I'm I'm thinking Barry Sanders. I'm sorry. Emmett bounced like Emmett went to the area. Yeah, okay, I was thinking Barry Sanders because like he was catching up on him, and then he was like, "Nah, I'm good." You're like, yeah. dude, like you have like. A lot of years left still, but yeah, Emmett Smith, he was uh, just so little and just just so like awesome, like, you know, like, and I mean, I wasn't a Cowboys fan, but like you couldn't not respect like what he did right. back then. Like you just can't sure. like some people like obviously if you're a fan of like, you know, Niners. I guess. Yeah, I guess if like if you're like a Niners fan, then you're going to hate on him or For if sure. you're if you're a, uh, you know, a literally anything fan in the AFC East, you're going to hate on the, the Patriots team probably. and Tom, well, you're going to hate on Tom Brady, right? Like sure. you're going to, it's, but it's like, at the end of the day, like you have to respect greatness. Like it doesn't like you have to, you know what I mean? Like right. you just have to. That's uh, what you learn when you start playing fantasy. You start playing <laughs> fantasy football. It's like, Oh, who's your team? It's whoever I have in this week. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. What, uh, what, okay, this is a good one too. What's your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? <laughs> God, Peter, there's been so many. <laughs> uh, no, I, I would say like, you know, when people ask me, man, you ever think if you threw a little further and you went to the Olympics? <laughs> well, I mean, yes, most days of my life. Most <laughs> days when I wake up, yes, yes, that's what, it's not an every four years thing for me. Um, right. I was, let's see, like my head's this wide, right? Like I was about that far away from yeah. one of the Olympics. That's crazy. So, I mean, my most, my most notable failure, probably that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's a hard, cause it's like to be an athlete at a high level, 
you you're the best of you're still the best of the best but it's just one of those things where it's like there's always someone unless you're the top person there's always going to be someone that's a little bit better than you or even you know in team sports like you might have the best record but it may not necessarily guarantee that you're going to win that championship like that one day that other team might just you know execute a little bit better it just it is what it is man. that's what it was yeah. That's what it was. It wasn't that I had never thrown far enough. The, 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 yeah. My furthest throw was enough to make it. I was actually sort of expected to make it. And I just didn't do well enough on the day. So, yeah. like, it is what it is. But uh, yeah. if you talk about something that's just, you know, kind of replays <laughs> in your mind every day. So what, so what did you learn from it then? What did I learn from it? Um, it's, po- it's possible that I didn't do enough. Maybe. Yeah. So um, it, it might be that because like, I was definitely known, I was known for getting it done on the track and like doing the most in in the bar, in the club, like uh, afterwards, you know, like uh, I trained hella hard, the most hard. Ask my coach, trained the most hard. I competed with the most vigor, the most intensity. And then I partied with the equal amount of, of just right. aggression and recklessness. I mean, USC, so, man, come on. Sure, right? The best parties. If you're going to party somewhere. Not bad. <laughs> so, I mean, could I have not done that and been better? I don't know. Was that yeah. the outlet I needed in order to be the, someone that performed at that level? I don't know. So what if is always going to be, what if I didn't do that, right? right. Like, what if I um, applied everything? Yeah. I guess so. I get it. What I learned from it, in order to be the best, you need you might need to apply more than you think. Might yeah. be everything. I like it. At least it takes it takes like a. And I, and I can speak for myself. Like my dad, for example, was like a, a track star, right? Okay. And what had all had all these. Uh, he was a hurdler actually. Uh, oh, cool. Two hundred and the four hundred were like his main races. And, uh, you know, had all these scholarships, whatever, got involved with the wrong people and then became something completely different. And it affected the way he was towards me, for example. And so it's like one of those things where it's like he probably had to live with the fact that he also like he I mean he really messed up (laughs) he really he went to jail and all kinds of stuff and so it's like but I don't think I think he went the other way whereas you're a little bit more productive with things right like you're you're you've taken I hope so but yeah I mean you you have your own you have your own business you know you're not smoking meth like you know stuff like that (laughs) and whereas him it was like it went the other way like his regret or maybe he'd never accepted responsibility for the fact that he would you know he was the reason why he didn't continue and so I think like you have accepted like hey man you know I could have done it but you know it is what it is now I learn from that and move on right yeah and now be successful in this other thing so okay so if people if people need a recruiter they need to go to where wrsearch.com wrsearch.com we'll put it in the show notes so all of our millions of listeners can listen to it Uh, that's where you'll find that big uh rabbit head i did a a a photo shoot with this company that did my website and so there's me walking around in a suit through the streets of san diego with a rabbit head on it turned some heads that's great for sure um let me let me ask you one more question um what's uh if you were me I like asking this question. If you were me interviewing you, is there something that you would have asked you that I didn't ask you? That is a good question. Hmm. Let's see, we touched on my current business, right? Like I'm I'm recruiting now. We touched on a personal training career. My sweet nugget about Daniel McGelvaney, check him out. Um, Yes. Here we go. I mean, not that you even could have asked it, but I'm going to touch on something you didn't touch on. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you feel about oatmeal? <laughs> how do you feel about oatmeal, Corey? <laughs> no, no, no. That's my question to you. So oh, like, it's something we didn't touch on. 
and it'll come back. But we, what we did touch on is you told me a little bit about Performa, right? And kind of the products they provide and stuff. So Correct. give me your thoughts on oatmeal as a thing. Wait, oh, no, you're asking. Okay, so that wasn't the now, question. I know. <laughs> what would you ask me? There's nothing. We covered everything. Okay. But um, there's this thing that I would have so, spoken so this, about that you wouldn't have been able to ask me about. So this is funny. So I was, I don't know who I was talking to about this literally the other day. You know, people always ask, I'm sure people always ask you the same thing. Like people always ask me like, what should I eat? Like, you know, I want to lose weight or what, like, what should I eat? And I'm like, well, everybody's different, right? Like everybody's different. There's a million factors, you know, you can get as specific as like, what blood type are you and all those things, right? That's how you really get the nuts and bolts of everything. Like you got to get very specific. And I can say that from like, probably for a good 10, 15 years, pretty close to there. I had oatmeal for breakfast almost every day and orange juice. And then Mm -hmm. at some point, mid thirties ish, my body started changing and I would feel like when I ate certain things, oatmeal included, I would feel kind of bloated maybe. Mm. Um, I was retaining a little bit more water and it was when I, was, like I said, it was like, as I got older and I, I realized that I needed to start eliminating certain carbs from my diet. Sure. Um, and that was one of the things. So like I used to love oatmeal and for some people I suggest it to them, but I just don't eat it anymore, which is crazy. Cause I used to eat it every day. So it's a sad, it's a sad day for me. Like maple brown sugar quaker oatmeal with some peanut butter in it and then some collagen protein like what do you what else do you want in the morning but i just it doesn't affect me the same way anymore it messes it doesn't mess me up it's just i just feel sluggish and bloated and it's really weird it's sad that is sad i know it's too bad yeah i love oatmeal it's a great way to start the day in my opinion (laughs) i love that i like you already said you so you put the peanut butter in there before you cook it you throw a little protein in there after and mix it up. It's a delightful treat. It's a great it's way to the, start the day. Yeah. And, and normally, seeds, yeah, my, like, like my girlfriend, seeds, black seeds. my girlfriend used to put all, like she was more of like the chia seeds and even like, uh, what are those other things? Flax uh, seeds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 Flax seeds. And like, you know, just to add some more protein and stuff. And like, I guess like, cause I work out in the morning first thing always. Empty uh, stomach. And that, no, see, I don't do that. Ooh. I know. And that's a topic of discussion. Every, but every, everyone's different, right? Like for some people, for they sure. can do that and do very well. And then other people need a little bit of fuel. I'm one of those people, like I do need to eat a little bit in the I morning before I work out. So I throw a little butter in the coffee. So here's your question. All right. We yeah. talked about that for no reason. Here's your question. Yeah. <laughs> Corey, what are you doing now to stay competitive? Oh yeah. What are you doing now to stay competitive, Corey? Thanks for asking, Peter. Great question. <laughs> I am playing a ton of disc golf. Have you ever played? Is that like frisbee golf? Sure. Yeah, that. Same yes. thing. I mean, they're not they're I, not actually yes, that's the thing. They're not actually like frisbees, like the big thing you throw at the beach, they're smaller. Uh-huh. But yes, but that's and what you, it is. And you throw it through like a hoop and stuff. It's like a golf no, course. No, you throw it into a basket with chains. That's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. it's on a golf course. Okay. So, so I grew up. I, I do grew that up, in the afternoons. I grew up in the hood, so we had to use hula hoops. We didn't have sure. like fancy. <laughs> I didn't play growing up, but that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm doing that a ton. I haven't started my tournament career yet, but soon. Uh, other than that, pick up basketball. Try not to hurt people. Yeah, that's that's you know? I, when I see what that's what it. what gym are you going to? Because are you doing twenty four hour? Oh, really? That's funny. That's twenty four hour. Wait, yeah. which one? Because there's there's some nice ones in La Jolla. Yeah, I don't go fucking up oh. there. That's so far away. Oh, okay. I don't I'm know in La Mesa, were. so uh, okay. I go to College Grove. It's like six, five, six minutes from my house. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I've been, whenever I perform, and, that's when I, I had a 24-hour membership for a long time. Uh, and whenever I'd go down and perform in San Diego, I would either go to the La Jolla one or there's another one. Couldn't tell you where it was. I just would use my GPS. But, like, they all have, oh, like, yeah. a turf and stuff. Like you know, Most do, now, yeah. Yeah. See, Let look at that. Know got, fired, got fired from 24 hour fitness and still giving them my money for yep. membership. That's how it works. Uh, They're around. Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm actually going to be in San Diego uh, the 
hold on. I'm looking at my calendar. Sorry, Performa fans. Um, the 8th and 9th, no, 9th and, no, yeah, 8th and 9th. Is that a Friday and Saturday? Yeah, of October. So I'll be down That's there. Okay. Doing, I don't know where the shows are. They're like at these breweries, but I'll be down there. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, dude. So good so man. Um, tell everybody where they can find you on social media, buddy. Social media, shit. Uh, CB Dub Fit. C B D U B F I T. Okay. On Insta. See, I don't really see, fuck around there much, but I mean, really? if I see a bunch of people add me, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll, I'll share more about my life. We'll see. We'll see how 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 uh, how big the reach is of the Performa Nation. Um, give all him right. some love. Give Corey some love. Um, all right, dude. I'm gonna I'm gonna end it, but just hang on for a second, okay? Uh, thank you, Performa Heroes, Performa Nation. Make sure you follow Corey. Check out his business, uh, WR Recruiting. Search. WR Search. I mean, we'll put it in the show notes, but uh, and uh, this has been the Performa Podcast. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.